Well, good morning. Welcome to, to River Church. If you're new here, I'm glad you're here. I, I look forward to meeting you before the day is over. I'm going to tell you about two friends that I had in Albuquerque, two businessmen, uh, dear friends of mine. Loved them both. They're still in Albuquerque. Two businessmen. I want to tell you how uh, they were very different. You, you might want to you might want to consider which one of these two businessmen you are more like. The way that they were, were different uh, is found in how they viewed their resources. We might use the word money, although resources certainly refers to more than just money, but how they viewed their resources, and that is how they were very different, these two businessmen. Uh, businessman number one, he was always putting money back into his business. And not only that, he was also giving his resources away. We call that generosity. He was a, he was a generous man. Uh, he was always giving things away. He was always giving to the church. I knew that because I was one of the pastors of the church and I knew that he was a very generous man toward God and a very generous man toward the church. He gave stuff away to help people on an individual basis. And businessman, businessman number one, uh, he <clears throat> Whenever he needed something, because he had a very successful business, whenever he needed money, as businessmen at times do, whenever he needed money, he would go to the bank. I would watch him do this. And, and, and they, would, they would say, no problem, Mr. McDaniels. Here you go. And they would, they would loan him money. And, and, and then he would he would invest that money and, and he would use that money well. He had what we in, in pop culture call an abundance mindset. Meaning that, that he thought there was there was always money to be found. And there was always enough money to be shared. That's that's the sort of economy, philosophically, that he lived in. Like, that was his mindset. Now, businessman number one, I should tell you that, that, that he also, he went bankrupt one time. I, I, I happen to know, I happen to know some of the details, and I, I know that it had to do with unethical business practices of, of one of his employees who, who lied repeatedly over the course of time to him, but he did, he did, he did go bankrupt to, to, to shutter his business. But you know what he did? My friend, here's what he did. He, he landed on his feet. He found some more money and he started another business and he's been successful at that. He had what we call an abundance mindset. Businessman number two, also loved dearly, he was always unable to put money back into the business. Because his kids needed stuff, or, or he was going on a vacation, and, and he was worried that if he put money back into the business, well, he personally might suffer as a result. <coughs> he was he was always worried about having to shutter the business, ha having to, 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 to close, potentially close the business down. And he was, he was always worried because clients weren't paying their invoices and he was about to run, run out of money and he wasn't sure if he was going to make payroll that week. It was one financial crisis after another financial crisis. And you know what? His business never Great. It was just a very static sort of business. And for him, for, for, for friend number two, businessman number two, 
uh, it's like it's like money was always scarce, and, and in his mindset, there was not enough to go around. And there was not enough to be shared, else he personally might run out. <clears throat> and that's what we in pop culture refer to as a scarcity mindset. Now you might be wondering, what does that have to do with the Bible and God's economy? And I think it's very relevant. We're going to talk about that today. Let's turn to <clears throat> Genesis chapter 13. If you brought a Bible, you can turn there. I'm going to project it as well. Genesis chapter 13. We continue in this study of Genesis, and over the last few weeks we've been studying um, Abraham. He's still at this point in the story called Abram, but we know that his name will ultimately be changed to, and we know him more commonly as Abraham, the father of the nation of Israel. Before we, before we pick up, we're actually going to start with verse 2. Before we pick up with this story, I want to... I want to point something out that's very, very important. It's not only true of Abraham, it's true of all of the, the patriarchs in the Old Testament and all of the, the men and women in the Old and New Testament that we would consider heroes. Here's what I want you to understand. There's one hero in the Bible, and that's Jesus Christ. And then there are all these people in the Bible that are broken like you and broken like me. And, and, and the one common theme is we all need a Savior. We all need the hero. Abraham isn't the hero. Nor Moses or King David or the Apostle Paul for that matter. Now at times I will say, you know, Moses and Joseph, Jesus' adoptive daddy, they're two of my heroes. In a sense they are. But ultimately, that's not what the story of the Bible is about. I, I say that because, because we're going to talk about Abraham today. And last week, I won't revisit the story, but last week's story was a real low water mark in Abraham's life. It was a real low point. Now, what we're going to look at today is, is, is another one of these real high water marks in Abraham's life. Isn't that just like our life? Abraham, another high water mark. But what we really, what we really want to camp out on is he needs a savior. He needs God to come along and save his soul. As do we. With that in mind, let's let's read beginning in uh, verse two of Genesis chapter thirteen. It says now Abraham was was very rich in livestock. In silver and in gold. And he journeyed on from the Negev as far as Bethel to, a, to the place where his tent had been, been at the beginning. Bethel is really important. We'll talk about that in a moment, which it's really important. He traveled on to Bethel, to the place where his tent had been at the beginning, between Bethel and Ai, to the place where he had made an altar at the first. And there, Abraham called upon the name of the Lord. So Abraham has gone away to Egypt. It's been a low point in his life. And he comes back to Bethel, where he first met the Lord. And now, once again, he calls on the name of the Lord. Verse 5, and Lot, that's his <coughs> nephew. And Lot, who went with Abram, he had gone with him to, to, uh, to Egypt. Um, also had flocks, and he also had herds, and he also had tents, so that the land could not support both of them dwelling together. For their possessions were so great that they could not dwell together. And there was, and there was strife. There was strife between the herdsmen of, Abr of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. At that time, the Canaanites and the Perizzites 
were dwelling in the land. These were pagan people who did not follow the God of the Bible. Verse 8. Then Abram sent a lot, said to his, his nephew, his, his deceased brother's son, he said, Lot, let there be no strife between you and me. Well, let there be no strife between your herdsmen and my herdsmen. For we, for we are kinsmen. It's like we are, we are friends and brothers and, and relatives. Verse 9, is not the whole land before you? And he probably points to uh, Canaan and and the Jordan Valley and, and, and all that, that, that we know became the nation of Israel. He points to all of that. He says, is, is not the whole land before you, Lot? Separate yourself from me. If you take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if you take the right hand, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes. And he saw that the Jordan Valley was well watered everywhere, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt in the direction of Zor. And this was, this was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. That story is coming real soon. Verse 11. So Lot chose for himself all of the Jordan Valley, and we live in the valley, we know what that entails. That entails water and life and vegetation. A good place to raise livestock. He chose the Jordan Valley and Lot journeyed east. Thus they separated from each other. Abraham settled in the land of Canaan. While Lot settled among the cities of the valley and moved his tent as far as Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked great sinners against the Lord. Verse 14. The Lord said to Abram, you know, Lot, Lot's gone. The, the Lord said to Abram after Lot had separated from him, Abram, lift up your eyes. Lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are. Look northward and southward and eastward and westward, the Lord says to, to Abram, for all the land that you see, for all the land that you see, I will give to you and I will give to your offspring forever. I will make your offspring as the dust of the earth, so that if one can count the dust of the earth, your offspring can also be counted. Arise. Walk through the length and the breadth of the land, for I will give it to you, Abram. For Abram moved his tent and came and settled by the oaks of Mamre, which are at Hebron. And there he built an altar to the Lord. The word of the Lord, which I give thanks. So in today's story, we have we have two, two characters. We have Uncle Abraham, I'll call him that, even though he's still, he's still literally called Abram in this story. Uncle Abraham and um, nephew Lot. Two men with two very different outlooks on life. In some ways, not unlike. In some ways, quite similar to. Um, the, the two friends that I told you about are here. And today I want each one of us to ask, who am I more like? Am I more like Abraham? Or am I more like Lot? For this is a story of one man's growing, generous heart and another man's Tendency to exploit other people. Take advantage of others for his own good. And, 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 and I'll say this. You, me, all of us, we are either living 
in, in what I would call, what I often call, God's economy, or we're living in the world's economy. And what God is going to be doing over the next, or over the course of, Abra of, of Abraham's life as we study him, is he is, he is stretching and growing Abraham, call, calling him to trust him, calling him to live in my economy, God would say to, to, to Abraham. Meanwhile, Lot continues to live in the economy of the world. So what's the context, like the backstory uh, for today's reading, for today's passage? Well, it, well it's family stress. Remember the, the, these two family members and their, their herdsmen, probably their, their relatives as well. They're not getting along. It's just not enough land uh, for us to share. So, so, so the context is family stress, the, the pressure cooker of family stress. Can I get an amen? And some of you know exactly what that's like. And, and in that context, in, in this case, uh, the piece of land they're grazing could not support them both. In, in that context of family stress, each man responds in, in a way that sets him apart from the other man. And, and when you are going through family stress, we just came off the holidays, maybe you had some extended family stress, how you respond, it, it gives us a window into your heart, a picture of what's really going on down deep inside, what your motivations are, which economy you're living in, God's economy, or if you're just like all the rest, and have you ever had anybody say that to you and it just cuts you, cuts you deeply when they say, you're just like everybody else? Well, from a Christian perspective, what I believe is a person is trying to say is, like, there are these special people and they're the ones that live in God's economy. And then there's just everybody else. They're no different from anybody else. So, so in this story, Abraham, Abraham has come to this place called Bethel. And Bethel, for him, represents spiritual awakening. Some of you all know my daughter goes to a school in California called Bethel. And I think they would say that we've chosen that name because that name in the Bible represents a spiritual awakening. You probably have a place that we could call your Bethel. Uh, I have a place. I won't tell you where it is. It, 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 it's, the, the place itself, it's nothing, it's nothing significant or special, except that it is special because it's, it's for me, it's my Bethel. Like, like Abraham had his Bethel. It's a place where you experience spiritual awakening. Um, the, the, the reading, today's reading, says this. Abraham began to call on the name of the Lord. At Beth, that's where it all started. He began to call on the name of the Lord. Maybe, maybe, maybe a place for you that marks your spiritual awakening. Uh, uh, maybe a place where you heard from God for the first time. Think about that. What, what might your Bethel be? Maybe a place where you go... Um, often, when you really need to hear from the Lord, when you really want to talk to the Lord, that's the place that you go. Place that in the past sometime, God showed up in a really big way for you. That was for, Ab for Abraham, his Bethel. So he began to call upon the name of the Lord like he had never done before. Like this is a new experience. Like, like he's not a... a, 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 a a mature uh, believer at this point, he's just beginning to call on the name of the Lord. We, we need to cut Abraham some slack here. He's learning a new way. He, he's, he's learning a, a new rhythm in life. He's beginning to call upon the name of the Lord. He's going to make some mistakes. We've already read about some of his mistakes. He's going to make some more mistakes, but he's beginning <coughs> to call upon the name of the Lord. And he's learning a new way, a new dance, a new rhythm. He's learning a way of dependence on God. 
He's not going to be perfect at it because he's not, he's not the hero. Jesus is the hero. But, but he's, he's beginning to learn a new dependence on the Lord. He, he's beginning to learn what a heart of generosity might actually look like. And by the way, generosity feeds on dependence, and dependence feeds on generosity. We need, we tend to think one day when I'm independent, and when I'm when I'm independently wealthy, then I will be generous. And really, in God's economy, it's quite the opposite. Generosity leads to a dependence on the Lord. Like I don't know if I can spare this, but I'm going to trust you, God, and I'm going to be generous. So, so in contrast to Abraham, to Abraham nephew, uh, Abraham, I'm sorry, in contrast, Abraham's nephew, uh, uh, Lot, as I've already called, as I've already used this phrase, he, he had a scarcity mindset. You see that in how he, he goes for the gold. He, he chooses the best land for himself. He must have thought there's not enough to go around for me and, and my uncle. If I if I share the land with my uncle, uh, the herdsmen are gonna fight. Or I might run out run out myself. So he chooses the good land. Which hey, I would do the same thing. You probably would too. He chooses the good land. Um, Never mind that the fact that it is inhabited with wicked people. He'll put up with that because he wants the good land. So when Abraham gives Lot the first choice of land, Lot chose the well-watered Valley of Jordan, knowing full well this is the better land. I don't care. My, my uncle gave me first choice. I'm taking the better land. However... He also knew that it was the land filled with wicked inhabitants. So Abraham, Abraham began to call on the name of the Lord at Bethel, and, and it, it made him a generous man. It made him say to, to his, his nephew, you go first. And, and Lot, he is greedy, and it leads him to a new land filled with wicked inhabitants who practiced pagan religions. He went that way when Abram called upon the name of the Lord. So there's several things, several things that I think Lot didn't know. And maybe we don't know these things. Maybe we need to be reminded of these same truths. There's several things that Lot didn't know because he was, he was foolish. And without, without the knowledge of the word of the Lord, I too am foolish. So let's talk a little bit about what Lot didn't know. Number one, he didn't know that prosperity actually comes by the hand of God. What I mean by that is, uh, prosperity doesn't come by your own hand. And you know, some of you, like like you're, you're sitting down on the inside, uh, on the outside, but you're standing up on the inside saying, hey, ready, I'm the exception. I am prosperous, and I've done it. I've done it by the sweat of my own brow, on my own, with my own two hands. I'm. I'm going to say it again. You, in God's economy, you and I, we cannot manufacture prosperity. And you might say, "Sure, I can. Uh, sure, I can, Randy." Oh, you think you can? You think you can, but then, then the stock market crashes, or your competitor underbids you, and then you go from something to, to nothing, and, and, and we realize, you know, this prosperity thing, it comes from the hand of the Lord. I tend to think that I do it myself, but I don't. It comes from the hand of the Lord. We aren't that smart. We think that we are, and, and, and what Lot didn't realize in his foolishness is that prosperity actually comes by the hand of God. Remember, remember what God said to, 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 to Abraham 
Abraham might have been thinking like, wow, I just let, I just cut Lot loose. And he just picked the valley, uh, the river. So I, now I've got the arid, I've got the arid portion of, 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 of the land. You know, I, I wonder, I'm speculating here, but I wonder if Abraham is like second guessing himself. Like, should I have really done that? But what does Abraham, what does God say to Abraham? He basically says, look, look, Abraham, prosperity comes by my hand, not by your hand. What does he say to him? He says, look north, look south, look east, look west. One day your, your descendants will inhabit all of this land. Why? Because prosperity comes by the hand of the Lord. Not really by the sweat of your own brow. Second thing that, that, that Lot didn't really know, it's quite similar to number one, is this wealth is a curse without the Lord's blessing. Wealth is a curse until the Lord makes it a blessing. We could probably spend um, hours today, one by one, coming up here and, and telling stories of how we've seen people accumulate wealth and how it was their their ruin their ruin there were it, it was it was not a blessing it was not a curse i mean it was a curse it, it, it's as though the lord might say to us you want wealth you know what you may not be able to handle wealth third thing that uh, that lot didn't understand is this exploitation you know that word exploitation, it means that we take advantage of other people. We exploit other people. A lot didn't understand that exploitation brings God's swift judgment. Do, do you know that? We, we talk often about we talk often about how the Bible says that God is just. In fact, in Jeremiah, uh, among other places, God says, I want, I, want, I want it to be known that I am that, that I, I'm marked by love and justice. I'm a God of love and I'm a God of justice. And, and, and what you may not know is that when we read about the justness of God, how God is a God of justice, you know how that most often plays out? It most often plays out in that God says, the weak and those who cannot defend themselves and those who are kicked around and mistreated, I will one day right every one of those wrongs. I will one day take the humble and I will lift them up. And I will one day, one day take the proud and I will, put them, lay, I will lay them low. And that is, that is a summary of the justness of God. I put this pad. I, we're not going to. We're not going to reject it. But I, I have saw. I reference Psalm eighty-three. You can look that up later. It, it speaks to this truth. There are dozens of passages in the Old Testament which, which basically say, uh, "Give justice to the weak, to the fatherless, to the poor, to the needy." The theme throughout the Bible is this: God is just, and that is that is played out most prominently in His fighting. In God's fighting for the underprivileged and the migrant and the widow and the orphan and the weak and the person who cannot defend himself. That's a theme throughout the Bible. And, and Lot, Lot thought, I can exploit people for my own good and nothing, there'll, there'll be no harm in that. What he didn't realize is that God's swift judgment comes on those who exploit others. And then the last thing that, that Lot didn't understand is this, that the generous man will always prosper. And I, I have such a hard time, I have such a hard time living my life with that confidence because I'm, I'm broken. I'm like, I'm like you in many ways. And we tend not to believe that. We tend not to believe that the generous man will prosper. If you're, if you're driven by the scarcity mindset that I described earlier, then you tend not to, not to believe that as, as being true. 
But I'll show you from Scripture here in just a minute how that is true. So here's where I want to go. I want us to ask some questions now. Questions. And, and these questions are intended to reveal whether I am more like Uncle Abraham or, or I'm more like Matthew Lot. And I think that's good. I think it's good for me to ask that question of myself and, and for you to ask that question. Am I more like Abraham or am I more like Lot? Here's the first question. These are really basic questions, which is good because we can, we can self-evaluate here for a moment. Question one, am I, am I generous? And, and nobody's going to answer out loud here, and um, well, you know, we're not going to evaluate you. You're going to self-evaluate. But am I, am I a generous person? And, and you have freedom to, to, uh, to, to, to make that decision and to, to evaluate yourself. And, 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 and I, I, uh, I can't answer that question for you. But I would ask you to, to consider, am I, and if, I'm, if I am, or if I'm, if I'm not, what does that say about me? Proverbs 11 says this, Proverbs 11 says, the generous will prosper. Those who are generous, they will prosper. Those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. That is a hard biblical <coughs> ethic. That, that is a hard biblical ethic for us to embrace. Because if you're like me, I tend to think if I refresh others, then then my my kids may not have shoes uh, for, 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 for the next school year because I might run out. You know, if I refresh others, uh, ain't nobody gonna refresh me. I'm gonna run out. <clears throat> and I just want us to embrace the fact that, that we can live our lives like that, but that is not living in God's economy. This scarcity mindset is not living in God's economy. That, that phrase, I've, I've been using that phrase, um, scarcity mindset and abundance mindset, um, it actually comes, uh, it, it, I believe it was coined by Stephen Covey. He wrote a, a famous book a long time ago, and uh, not that long ago, but it's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. I'm not, I'm not uh, encouraging you to read that book, and you read it if you want, but I think the phrase and the, 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 the terms are, are, are good terms. I think if we, if we, if we look at it from a biblical concept, or context rather, really sheds light on how I am or am not living in God's economy. Abundance mindset leads to a heart of generosity. Scarcity mindset founded on the idea that if someone else wins, then that means I have to lose. A scarcity mindset says if someone else is successful in a situation, that means I'm unsuccessful. If someone else looks good, that makes me look bad. And Abraham was generous and he gave Lot first choice and he didn't begrudge him and, and he didn't try to talk him out of it. And some of you here today are very generous people. And um, and some of you aren't. And I don't I don't know who is generous and who isn't generous. Some of you, for instance, are very generous toward the church, and some of you aren't. And I don't know who is and who isn't. And and, and I, but you know. And 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 do you know? Do you know as a church that that if we if if we were all generous. If we were all generous toward the church, if we were all givers, right? side note, this may blow your mind, but some people in this church 
they they figure out what they make on a, on a, week, on a monthly basis, a weekly basis, a monthly basis, a yearly basis, and they say, okay, what, what's 10% what's of that? Or in some cases, more. And then they give that money to the church. Lydia and I do that. You pay me a salary. There's not an ebb and flow based on how much comes into the uh, the offering plate. Or like Lydia, I don't take the offering plate home at the end of the day. No, the elders count that. They put that in the bank and they pay me. You all pay me. Did I say something I didn't mean to say? What? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Think about my preaching is the things that I think are funny, y'all don't even think are funny. And the things that I don't think are funny, y'all find funny. That's so. why I'm a preacher, not a comedian, I suppose. Um, yeah. Yeah, literally I don't take the basket home at the end of the day. That is true. Uh, but but we I receive the same amount every month. It's a salary. And then Lydia and I give 10% of that to the church. And, and, and some of you all do that, and some of you all don't. And I think, I don't, I don't, I bet I haven't said that in a year. But it's good for me to every once in a while say, you know, some people do that. And that's, that is, that is the beginning, that is the wellspring of, of generosity in the life of a, of a believer. But what I really want to say is this. Do you know what we could do? What we could do as a church, if we were all generous think about that what we could do as a church and, and dream big I have I have just like a couple of ideas I didn't spend much time thinking on this uh, I spent a little bit of time thinking about this 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 week like if we was just, if we as a church had like more than enough money because you are all every one of us we were just generous toward God and we were generous toward the church now, this would not just be my choice. We as elders would, uh, would, would make this decision as a, as a team. But, but the, the two things that jumped into my mind, one is I, I would hire uh, as many young staff members as I possibly could, like young adult staff members, to help us reach more young adults here in, here in Brownsville. That's one thing I would do. Not just up to me. We would decide as a as a as, as a as a group of elders. But and then the other, the only other thing I, I wrote down is that we we could start a Spanish speaking service on Sunday early afternoons. We could we could we could fill this place with people that, 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 that are way more comfortable in Spanish. We could fill the stage with, with musicians, and, and, and we could worship in Spanish, and we could preach in Spanish. And, and those are the two ideas as I was thinking about what if we had more money. But, but these dreams, they require generous people. And maybe you, maybe you give uh, to some other church, or maybe you give to some other mission cause, and, and that's that is your prerogative and that is your uh, freedom. But let me just say, if you're not generous toward your home church, I think it's something you should evaluate. I think it's something. I think it's hard to build a case that you're a generous person if you're not generous. For the Lord. So I think it's good for us to evaluate and consider that and ask this first question. Am I really living in this scarcity mindset? Question number two is very similar, but I like the wording, so I decided to go ahead and go with it. And that is, are you, am I cheap? Which uh, is, is sort of the same, but it's sort of not. Uh, do I spend too much time worrying about and thinking about stuff and the finances? And look, I understand. I, I mean, I've got I got I got five kids, and quite a few of them are still living under my roof. And I and I understand that 
that the stress of money and finances and all that, I, I get that. And I, I have a great deal of, 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 of empathy toward you in that. But, but, but let's just be honest. Most of us, most of us, we are like, compared to the rest of the world, for sure, filthy rich, right? Like we've got a lot of discretionary income at the end of the day. It's just how we choose to use it. And so this question, am, am, I, uh, am I cheap? Um, what I mean by that is, like, some of us, we're, we would say, like, I'm, I'm super financially responsible, and I'm, I'm super frugal, and, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm saving for the future, and all those things are good, but often, that's just a thinly veiled disguise um, to cover up the fact that we, we're worriers, and we're greedy, and we are um, idolaters, you know, and we, would, we want that next big thing that we're going to buy. And we, we hide it under this, like, well, I'm being responsible, I'm being a saver, and I'm being an investor, and all those are good things. All those, but, 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 but down deep, what is the root? What is the cause? Um, there was a man, there's a man in Luke chapter 12, Jesus, let's just read it, it's Luke chapter 12. Then, then someone called to the crowd, they called, they called from the crowd, they called to Jesus, and they said this, they said, Teacher, um, please tell my brother to divide our father's estate with me. You know, I've heard, heard horror stories of the dividing of the estate, you know, at, at, at the end of, when, when, that day, when that day comes around, you know. Maybe you have a Maybe you have a horror story. Maybe you have a good story. But in this, that's the context here. Jesus is like, or the, the guy's like, Jesus, we're having this problem. Uh, we had a family meeting, and, and we're having a hard time dividing the estate. And Jesus does not really speak into that issue at all. He digs down much deeper. It's kind of like, well, why are you so worried about that estate? He does that in the form of a, of a story. Jesus replied, friend, who made me a judge over you? The God of the universe. Right? Who made me a judge over you uh, to decide such things as that? I think what he's saying is, you're really thinking in this, like, in the world's economy, that sort of mindset. Let me bring you into God's economy. Let me judge you based on this metric. Let's think over here rather than thinking over here, like, like, did you really get your fair share? Jesus pulls him over into this realm, into God's economy, and he says this, Beware, guard against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own. Verse 16, they told him a story, and here's the story. He said a rich man had a, had a fertile farm that produced fine crops. And then, we're not going to project the rest. Let me just tell you how the rest of the story goes. Jesus goes on, and actually I'll read it to you. He, uh, this rich man, he said to himself, imagine you're the rich farmer. The rich farmer says to himself, what should I do? I don't have room for all my crops. In other words, he didn't have enough barns for his crops. Imagine that. You, know? you ever thought about, like, maybe I need to build a third garage for my second boat and my other two motorcycles, right? You know, because I own the rust. He says, um, I don't have room for all my crops. Then he said, I know. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger barns. Then I'll have room enough to store all my wheat and all my other goods. He doesn't even stop there. He goes on. He says, and I'll sit back and say to myself, my friend, you have enough stored away for years to come. Now take it easy. Eat and drink and be merry. And then Jesus steps out of the story, just one, one degree, and he says, But God said to him, to this farmer, You fool, you will die this very night. Then who will get everything you worked for? And then verse 21, Jesus says, Yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but not have a rich relationship with God. 
I really don't think that in God's economy there's anything necessarily wrong with storing up worldly goods. But, but you're a fool if you do it to the detriment of your relationship with the Lord. Are you, are you cheap? <laughs> Last question, and then we're done, is this. Do I exploit, do I take advantage of others? And what does that say about me? And I don't know, I, I, I don't know where you're at, how you would answer this question. I happen to believe that we live in a place regionally where, where it's probably easier to exploit people than anywhere else, perhaps, any other region in the, in, in the country, I mean, in, in the United States. We live, um, we live in a region where it's, you, you actually have the opportunity at times to exploit people and get away with them. If you, don't, if you don't know why I say that, we can, I'll, you and I, we can talk offline. I can give you my thoughts on that a little more at other time. I won't, I won't uh, develop that any further. But, but just, just think through that in your own life. It's just, you know, it's just self-evaluation. Do I exploit? Do I take advantage of others? I don't know. Maybe in simple ways. Maybe at, at a restaurant, with people that help you at a restaurant. Maybe people that, that help you take care of your stuff. Do you, do you exploit? We've already talked about God's, God's heart for those who are easy to exploit. He is for those people. Do you exploit? Do you exploit? Um, I don't know, if you have a business, if you have a, if you have a business, you, customers, or clients, I'm not talking about making a, a good, honest living. You should do that. Do you take advantage of others just because you can? And maybe you'd say, you know, I'm not, I have no power in this world to exploit others. In fact, I'm a person, maybe a few of you here today would say, I'm a person who, who gets exploited all the time, who gets, who gets taken advantage of all the time. And I would tell you that God's heart is for you. In God's economy, He is, He is going to right that wrong. So as, as we as we close today, I was I was con I was considering like well, going forward now, what do I need to do? What how do I respond to this? Three simple thoughts. Um, one is I I would encourage you to rest in God's economy today. Rest in the fact. Rest in truths like like <laughs> like. He brings prosperity if it, if it comes. It's not, it's not something for you to worry or fret over. And, and, and if you're a generous person, He will reward you. He, he will bring uh, refreshing. You refresh others and, and He will refresh you. Uh, living in this, this mindset of God's economy, this, this abundance of Mindset. I would, I would first encourage you to, to rest in that. There are even there are even places in the Bible that, that use this term, uh, this this verb test to to test the Lord. Be careful with that word, right? But but in this context, I think it's good and right. You test the Lord. You you see, is is, is his economy really true? Is it really true that the generous man will prosper? Is it really true that if I refresh others, that, that the Lord will refresh me? I would encourage you to rest in God's economy. The other two thoughts are I would encourage you to look for ways to be generous. They're all around you. Well, one last thought on that. If there is, if there is a second most common way in which we are greedy today, as a people, and, and as a people at River Church, um, we are greedy with our other, our other most common resource, and that is our time. For 
some of us, being generous with our money is, is no problem, but don't ask me for my time. And if there's a need that we have at River Church, I would say it would be for more of your, for more of your time, for more of your emotional commitment. Um, so I would encourage you to think on that. You know, I always talk in terms of my dollars and my days. That defines me. How I spend my dollars and how I spend my days. That really defines me. How you spend your money and how you spend your time. That really defines you. And as God calls you to live in his economy, and God calls you to be a, a man of generosity, a woman of generosity, how are you investing your time? Let's do what I said. Let's, let's be so bold as to test God in this, to, to become a generous people and to see if God might reward God. If there's a way in which you want to invest your time. I mean, I feel like some of you, I just, I just browbeat you, and I, I'm sorry that I do that. Um, I just browbeat you over getting into a gospel community, but I do that because I, it, I believe it's good for you. It's not like I get paid extra if you get into a gospel community. It's not, there's, there's, there's not a whole lot personal uh, that I get out of it other than just a deep joy in, 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 in that I believe in. I believe in our small groups, our gospel communities. If you want to invest your time, put that on your connection card today, and we'll get you into the gospel community. You want to invest your time in service. Some of you did this last week. You said, I want to serve in this way with one of our different ministries here at River Church. It's a way of being generous with your time. Test the Lord. And see, if he, see if he doesn't reward you in that. Let's pray.